Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, and please give another very warm welcome to Nadia and Pia Paolo. Merci. There could not be a better context to talk about this idea of dialogues, of creative collaborations between disciplines, or as the uh, great Georgi Kepler said about the fear, uh, actually going beyond the fear of pooling knowledge, cr creating a pool of knowledge, than DLD, where so many uh, dialogues always can happen. Um, now, I wanted to maybe begin with the beginning and ask Nadia a little bit about the very long history of uh, such collaborations. Because in a way, it obviously our dialogue started exactly 10 years ago with Zaha Hadid. And we decided we would like to dedicate this uh, panel to the memory of our dear friend Zaha Hadid, who of course worked so closely with us at the Serpentine Galleries in London. <laughs> and Zaha gave us our motto, which we think about every day, um, she said in one of the conversations we had with her, uh, also here at DLD, that there should be no end to experimentation. And that very much, I think, can also be the motto of this panel today. Now, Nadia, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your friendship with Zaha, the first collaboration, of course, which was the Serpentine Pavilion in 2007, and then the many, many collaborations ever since. Well, you know, so I have to say, it's so wonderful to be here with you, um, Hans Ulrich, what an honor. And I associate Saha very much with you, and certainly that world of art and architecture. And um, I have to say, personally, I feel so honored that Saha even embraced the opportunity to work with us, to collaborate with us, not just on fashion projects, but also fine jewelry projects, and ultimately also architecture projects. Um, the last project we did with her was actually last March, where we launched the um, Krista piece at the Salone di Mobile. She certainly pushed our boundaries for that piece. Zaha pushed our boundaries in terms of everything we've done with her. Um, product development in Austria was always very shaken uh, by what she requested, but once we were able to create her vision, it was really such a true learning for both of us. So for us, that's a very good example of the stimulus that we get from the industry the industry appreciates what we can do, and we certainly appreciate the creative vision of the industry. It's a very symbiotic relationship, and Zaha certainly embodied that. And in the great book which uh, you published, and uh, actually about the history of Swarovski, uh, one can see that such creative collaborations have actually lasted for much more than a century. And it's a really wonderful book where Alice Rothorn, the great design critic, and you have to follow Alice Rothorn on Instagram. She is the best Instagrammer in the world, Alice Rothorn, about design. After you. <laughs> and um, it's really an extraordinary Instagram account where we can learn every day about design. And Alice wrote this introduction to your book where one learns so much about <clears throat> the early collaborations, actually the collaborations um, uh, with DR, the collaborations, which then lead, of course, to all the collaborations you are doing. So it would be great to hear a little bit about the history because the art historian Panofsky and I think that's very much connected to the panel and what we're going to discuss later about what you do with the Open Ball in Vienna. Panofsky said the future is often invented with fragments from the past. Mm -hmm. So maybe good to start mm -hmm. with some of these fragments and the mm -hmm. long history mm -hmm. of Swarovski's yeah. collaborations. No, absolutely. You know, in Swarovski, we've been here for 120 years. And um, really, it was uh, my great great grandfather was a tremendous pioneer in terms of crystal cutting. He was very innovative, he totally embraced the first um, uh, industrial revolution by embracing water power um, and then eventually electricity. Um, now we're in the digital era and we're certainly really trying to be always at the cutting edge and the forefront of um, the revolutions. But um, as crystal cutters, it was crucial. For example, my grandfather Manfred um, would drive from Wattenstirol for three days to visit his friend Christian Dior. And I, on that note, I must mention my grandmother always volunteered to drive him. Um, <laughs> of course, that also gave her the wonderful opportunity to visit Mr. Dior in his studio. Um, but it was really Mr. Dior who said to my grandfather he wanted a stone that emanated the northern light. And as a result of that conversation came the stone called Aurora Borealis, which still is our best-selling stone so many years later. Um, that was a very good example how the interaction between the designer and the manufacturer is absolutely crucial. Um, 
We've also had the chance to work with Coco Chanel way back when. Uh, what a fantastic visionary um, that mixed the uh, gemstones with crystal, with glass, and so on. Truly emphasizing the design was so important, not necessarily the material itself. And Balenciaga also, no? Balenciaga, um, and actually the first customer of Swarovski was, Jean, uh, was Queen Victoria via her uh, couturier Worth, based in Paris in 1895. And again, uh, so many years later, we're very excited to work with Queen Victoria's Nachfolgerin, um, Queen Elizabeth, adorning her gowns with crystal. And can you maybe tell us a little bit about the connection also to, to cinema? Because of course there are so many incredible movies in cinema history which are connected to Swarovski, The Wizard of Oz is one example, Breakfast That's at right. Tiffany. Well, you know, Swarovski had such an advantage. We were pretty much the only crystal manufacturer um, around the turn of the last century. So anything that we see uh, in the emergence of the silver screen, anything that we see that is meant to be a diamond was nothing but a Swarovski crystal. So yes, you're right. The slippers in, that Dorothy wore in The Wizard of Oz, the tiara by, uh, worn by Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's, Marilyn Monroe um, when she performs, uh, a gentlemen prefer blondes, and so on. So, and this is still a tradition that we upkeep today. Last year, for example, we worked with Disney. We created the Cinderella slipper. Currently, we're working with Disney on the movie that's coming out in March, Beauty and the Beast. So we're truly trying to be an ingredient within the film, something that's meaningful. But certainly, we're the company that helps the stars shine brighter. And of course, also this idea of artists. It was actually the late John Latham, the English artist, he said in the 1960s, together with Barbara Stevini, that we should have an artist placement group. He said every company should have an artist inside the company to permanently challenge uh, and basically to make it a much more creative you know, environment. So he positioned artists really in the core of society. It's obviously something you've been uh, doing uh, and which you continue so intensely today. And I wanted to ask you about one collaboration which is so legendary, which is your collaboration where you personally worked very closely with Alexander McQueen and wanted to hear how he pushed Swarovski to new horizons. Yes, I have to say, um, I personally was really trying very hard to follow the footsteps of my grandfather who worked with Christian Dior. So when I started to work in this company, I thought, well, who is my Christian Dior? And I encountered this young designer in England called Alexander McQueen. Nobody knew him. We invited him to Austria, showed him our products, and uh, one thing that was so special about him is that he was very appreciative of raw materials. He loved leather, wood, stone, and crystal was yet one more creative ingredient for him. And what Alexander McQueen did with that crystal on the catwalk was absolutely amazing for us at Swarovski. We could not have envisioned it. Um, and certainly it had a huge impact on the fashion industry. I think people wanted to emanate Alexander McQueen. And um, we certainly noticed that in terms of the crystal jewelry sales in the company. But he was a visionary and he was a really good example um, of how to use the product in a very relevant, sincere and impactful way. And it, that relationship kind of became a blueprint for us in terms of the various other business units that we have, whether it's architecture, whether it's jewelry, um, and so on. We always work with the most incredible visionaries that think out of the box, that think differently, yet who are very, very close at the pulse of the industry um, and are able to create products that are actually relevant to the consumer. And you mentioned the design and uh, the architecture, and it would be great to hear a little bit more about that because you've worked with Amanda Levitt, with Gaetano Pesce, Dilos Cofidio, Rem Kohlhaas, Ron Arad. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these architecture and design collaborations? Because sometimes it goes literally into, into crystal buildings. That's right. No, you absolutely. You also call it the crystal palace. You use That's the notion right. of the crystal palace, mm -hmm. which is, of course, a yeah. reference to 1851. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, I was nearly fired working at Swarovski because um, <laughs> I had this idea of reintroducing our chandelier components to the architecture industry. And I was told, no, I can't do that because our Chandelier components are not selling well, the chandelier is dead, and I shouldn't do it. So I thought, well, watch me. <laughs> and fire me if you must. So in any case, we went ahead and we did work with these amazing designers, and we did exhibit the pieces in uh, the Milan Furniture Fair, and my saving grace was the front cover of the New York Times saying that Swarovski Crystal Palace was the most outstanding exhibition at the fair. So I wasn't fired. Um, that person eventually left Swarovski, 
but sometimes it does show you have to trust your instinct, you have to listen to the designers, you have to believe in them and their creative vision. And once again, not only was it a really good uh, creative example of what a visionary can do with a product in order to make it relevant, but it also had a financial impact. So um, I think the consumer nowadays is so overwhelmed with products and it will be the beautiful and the relevant products that sell and that actually really also make a difference to people's lives. And before we now talk about the collaboration between you and, uh, and uh, Lagerfeld, I thought it would be interesting to hear from Pierre Paolo a little bit about the history of, uh, you know, Karl Lagerfeld's collaboration with artists and uh, not only the history but also the more recent projects. Can you tell yeah. us about, about that? No, actually for us collaborations is extremely important and I think actually for every fashion brand, designer brand or I think actually for a brand in general and why is that the case? Because if a consumer wants to engage with a brand and does not just want to buy a product the consumer wants to understand what is the whole designer about. And if I take the case of Karl Lagerfeld, he is a person who is extremely engaged and interested in art, engages with artists. He reads a lot. He's very interested in music. So his world is a very multidimensional world. And as, for us as a brand, it is important to bring that multidimension across to the consumer and engage in that way. Otherwise, it would be just a product you sell. That means, in a, in a way, we as a brand, as a designer brand, and I think actually brands in general should think about, okay, what is the consumer wants to engage with and what is the artist or the, the, here, the creative director interested in. So that's what we're trying to do to amplify, if you want so, the brand attributes. And then there's the other element, and I think you nicely described it, is the enabling part. There are just certain things that a brand or designer cannot do by itself. Mm -hmm. So if we were to say, well, we want to do amazing haute couture pieces and they shall look wonderful, and that is how you sketch it, how you design it, well, it very easily falls apart just by the fact that we have not the capabilities of the craftsmanship to do that, which then a partner can do. Or very recently, Carl, who is very much interested in architecture and has been engaged in that for many, many years, basically said, you know, what I would love to do is create a whole hotel myself, but not only create it, but really also kind of bring that hotel to life as I would like to wish to live in a hotel. And that is when we partnered up with a hotel operator and a hotel developer and we will open our very first six-star hotel next uh, year. But without partnering up, you can't do anything. So I think there is this need to engage with partners, to amplify your brand attributes, attributes and then at the same time as an enabler. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot create mm -hmm. a multidimensional mm -hmm. experience for mm -hmm. the consumer. And of course, the philosopher Isabel Stengers, <clears throat> she says she uses this notion of you know, new alliances. We permanently need new alliances with different fields to mm -hmm. make the impossible possible. And you have many of such alliances, of course. Can you tell us about some of these recent sure. projects like Stephen Williams? I love that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's actually it's, it's sometimes, it's really interesting sometimes also working with Carl. It's not like that he comes across and tells you about a very established artist or very established mu musician or whatever. He comes across with very sometimes totally unknown and you would always sometimes think uh, awkward uh, uh, propositions which then kind of you think about um, makes him also different and then we, we picked that up. We have very recently engaged with uh, Stephen Williams. He is um, an artist uh, from London. Maybe we can uh, show some pictures uh, of him who is a digital artist. Carl liked his digital work and then uh, Carl said, you know, I would love to have a part of my collection done with Stephen Williams. So we did that. Or then there is the uh, London-based street artist, uh, I Love Dust. Um, street artists that uh, we engaged with uh, to have painting our stores and bringing their ideas to life. So we gave them a, a white canvas. Carl said, let them put paint into our stores because I really like them, I love them, and I think they totally understand what, what I'm for. But then when I talk about awkward things, there's one awkward thing that 
I found awkward when we discussed it in the first place is like when we discussed about a collaboration with Mattel about Barbie. You know, would you think about this as a collaboration, artistic collaboration? Not in the first place, but then the point of the discussion also with Carl was like, look, our brand is also ironic in a way, and our brand is also about nowness. It's about modernity. So let's take the icon of Barbie and let's make an iconic Carl Lagerfeld design and bring it to life at the Paris Fashion Week, engage with bloggers in a new nowness way and have the Barbie then walk the catwalk and tweet about her experience at the Paris Fashion Week. And that's then a total different experience than just a doll. And then do not sell thousands, just sell a few hundred, make them very special and sell them only to the best luxury stores in the world. And that's what we did. But that is kind of amplifying your brand attributes, ironic, iconic, cross-cultural, and bring them to life in a, in a different dimension. It's fun. And what is interesting is that sometimes <clears throat> creative collaborations can be very slow. Sometimes it takes you know, years, sometimes decades for things to fall in place. And yeah. sometimes they can be instantaneous. They can be spontaneous. Yes. And it leads us now to the collaboration between Lagerfeld and Swarovski, because as you told me uh, before, Pier Paolo, it was a quite instantaneous, immediate kind of process uh, which uh, led to this collaboration on the open bar. But then yet at the same time, it's of course based on many years of dialogue. So yeah. it would be good to hear how the two of you collaborate. Yeah, uh, sh shall I shoot? Do I shoot for that? Yes, well, you know, I'm again. If you uh, look at the history that we have with Chanel, we associate that, of course, very much with Carl. Um, it's amazing to see how Carl has brought Chanel into the 21st century, actually, as well as many other brands. Um, we've had the honor to work with Carl on Atelier Swarovski. He created this beautiful bracelet, um, but we're taking it one step further in terms of uh, the Vienna Opera Ball with whom Swarovski has operated or worked with so many years, um, 50 years, actually. And um, they were very insistent that they would like to have a cutting edge designer create the tiaras for these debutantes. And um, I thought it was a very interesting equation to have a fashion designer actually create this tiara. Because I think a debutante today, quite frankly, stands for something slightly different than it did 50 years ago. And uh, we feel that Carl definitely gives it that edge. Yeah. What do you think? No, actually, I, what I loved really very much about it when uh, you when, when Nadja <coughs> came and, and explained the idea and said, OK, we're partnering up, we're partners of the Vienna Opera Ball, and we would love to do this with Carl. What do you think about that? It was not a decision-making process, as you just said, of month or weeks or whatever. It was a very spontaneous decision where Carl said, look, the idea here is there is the iconic, very traditional, but um, connotatious Vienna opera ball, opera ball that is supposed to be brought into a certain contemporary way forward in modernity. And that is done together with uh, Swarovski, who we know have a very cutting edge way of approaching things. We know that since many, many years. So that is a great triangle to do that. If one of the elements would not have been in case, like let's say pairing the tradition with modernity and having the yeah, proven track record that we had together uh, with, with you guys, it would not have happened. So in isolation, we could not have brought that forward, but as a triangle, we have been, and, and that's the great thing. So, uh, and, and even leading us to the next step of um, yeah, long-term partnership uh, in developing a jewelry collection together and bringing that to market is then the next uh, uh, step. But it's an, it's an amazing collaboration that went uh, pretty much uh, on the spot, actually. Yeah. And Nadia, can you maybe say a little bit more about this process? Because it's fascinating. I mean, the Vienna Opera, we're doing this project with the Vienna Opera for now 15 years with Museum in Progress, where we actually commission every year a contemporary artist to do the Iron Curtain. Because, of course, people spend a lot of time, you know, before the Iron Curtain goes up and down in front of this Iron Curtain, and it seemed the perfect exhibition platform. So we had Cy Twombly, over the years Richard Hamilton, and now this year actually uh, Tauber Auerbach do this Iron Curtain. When we made an analysis of the history of the opera, it's very astonishing that at the beginning they commissioned a lot of new operas. And over the last, I would say, you know, 50 years, it's mostly playing the old repertoire. There are very few new operas being commissioned. It's sort of decreased. And it's obviously very interesting 
in that context that all of a sudden it's possible to kind of do something new, do something dynamic. And it would be great to hear from you a little bit what's going to happen exactly in February. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there has been that embracing of the future, but at the same time, there's a certain sense of nostalgia for the traditional. And I think um, this is, again, tradition relevant with the ingredient of really the contemporary feeling. And um, I think the combination here with Carl, who has also very recently had a wonderful interpretation of the Salzburger Trachten within his fashion show, um, I think he's giving it a really beautiful spin, so to speak. And what's going to happen with the debutants? Because we're going to see, um, there's going to be a surprise also. First there is going to be a film, and then there's going to be a live surprise after the panel. Um, and it's very connected to the debutants. Can you talk a little bit about what's going to happen, what we're going to see? Today, you yeah. mean now? Yes, well, certainly um, we have a beautiful... Uh, I thought there was supposed to be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> no, in any case, um, again, I have to say this collaboration is really a collaboration of art in various different areas, whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's fashion, whether it's jewelry. And um, I think all of those artistic elements certainly are there for the adornment of the individual to take the individual through this very important ritual, in this case, um, coming out into society. And uh, what we'll see later today is um, the incredible tiara created by Carl on one of the amazing debutantes um, stepping out into her new chapter of life. And maybe before we see the film, I had one last question. I always think um, that it's interesting to talk about unrealized projects. And it kind of goes back to the beginning with uh, Zaha Hadid, because she, of course, about her extraordinary unrealized project. And then, towards the end of the life, they suddenly all got built. Um, and we do know a lot about architects' unrealized projects. And very often, actually, by publishing them, you know, they ultimately can get built. But we know very little about all the other fields, fashion, music, design, also art. What are the unrealized projects? So I always think it's interesting to map unrealized projects. I wanted to ask you both if you've got any unrealized creative collaborations, either between us, the two of you, or in general? Absolutely. Pia Paolo. No, no, you, you go for it. I have to think about it first. Give me that time. <laughs> well, I have to say, first of all, I think it's amazing all the different collaborations that you have um, done and just have shared with us. So we have one collaboration that is not realized yet, together with Karl Lagerfeld, but it soon will be realized um, at the Basel World, the jewelry fair in April, and we're very excited to be doing a further um, jewelry line with Karl Lagerfeld. Uh, it's a licensing deal. And I have to say, we're in such admiration of Karl to have that energy um, and the endless creativity to yet again em embark and embrace a new relationship and collaboration. Uh, now, now she, she had that one, what can I say? You know? <laughs> Actually, I could only mirror that one. No, for, for other unrealized uh, projects, despite the, uh, the one that Nadia just mentioned, which, which we are certainly very excited about, is I, I would basically leave it pretty much to what also probably Carl would say is like, we don't have unrealized projects unless they hit us. And they hit us actually every day and every week a lot new projects. So I'm pretty sure when going to the office again on Monday, there will be new projects. Uh, that uh, will be then uh, retrospectively spoken about uh, again at some point. And as our friend Zaha would have said, there should be and will be no end to experimentation. Nadia Piapaola, thank you so, so much. Thank you.